Very good to see you. See you. Charles, um, I'd like to uh, introduce the audience to Charles Lee, the Chief Executive of Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing. Um, I feel a little bit like somebody who's been refereeing a boxing match between two people <laughs> who can't meet. Um, I think it's fair to say Charles and David know each other. They have a good relationship. Um, uh, it's just our good fortune that this transaction has landed um, in the middle of this conference to, to give us a meaty discussion. You just heard what David had to say. Similarly, I'm going to be you know, uh, respectful of takeover panel rules, but also, and Charles, I should say, is a former journalist, uh, among many other things. Um, and I have to ask you, do you remember what was your best story that you ever wrote as a journalist? I wrote quite a lot of story, but at the time, I was, you know, remember I was working for a Chinese newspaper in the 80s. Ah. There's not a lot, whole lot of freedom to write whatever you want. That's true. <laughs> um, I will, um, I mentioned this before, I did a bit of digging around to see what was the first time I'd ever written an article on an exchange. And it turns out that it was on the Hong Kong Futures Exchange in 1991. And let me just read you um, the first paragraph of that story. 1991, I was a junior reporter at uh, Reuters in Hong Kong at the time. Um, Hong Kong's battered futures exchange is back on its feet four years after a global stocks crash almost closed it down, but analysts doubt it will attract enough speculative smaller players to really take off. So um, fast forward to now, and we're not talking about the Hong Kong futures exchange, of course, we're talking about a much bigger entity, the Hong Kong exchanges and clearing. Um, what's really striking about the Hong Kong exchange, I think, and not many people realized this still, I think, perhaps, certainly I didn't when I was covering it uh, until later, was that you, you have been, for the last many years, the number one or number two exchange in the world by market capitalization. You're very, very big. You and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or the CME Group have, you know, sw swapped status as the first and second largest exchange. So for anybody looking at this transaction that you've tabled for the London Stock Exchange Group, thinking that you know, this is a small exchange in Asia, would be making a big mistake. You have, you know, balance sheet, you're very large. So just to kind of set that scene in terms of what the Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing Group is, you're, you're a multi-asset, very large global exchange. Why do this deal now? What's the rationale for this now? Why London now? Well, I think uh, we really think now is actually the time to think big. This is the time everybody is trying to retrench and think internally. This is the time, actually, in our view, it's really when the world is now becoming more and more polarized into the east and west, the two center of gravity, we need to have a market infrastructure globally that are able to underpin that great two centers of gravity. So our idea for the transaction is a very simple vision, but it's a very big dream. So together, we think we're going to create an unrivaled global market infrastructure group that is going to be unrivaled across all asset classes, across all you know, uh, you know, global currencies, across the time zones. And together, we complete each other. And together, we will unlock the last frontier of the global financial center. There are 27 trillion US dollars sitting in the Chinese banking system that we know gravity is such. That's like a three gorgeous water up there is going to go to the sea, is going to find its way to deploy into the global scene. So even if we think only 10, 20 percent of that is ultimately going to hit the global market, we are talking about tidal waves of wealth deployment globally. But it's very, very difficult to do. You know, it's, it's one thing to think there's a big idea, very excited that China is coming and we're going to try to do it. But practically speaking, it is very difficult when we talk about China's capital control, when we talk about China's obsessive way of not wanting to do it. It's not because they don't want it to do it. They wanted to do it. But structurally, people need to understand that the Chinese market today is no longer the same as everybody else anymore. I think China, for 30 years, essentially saying, we're going to change ourselves to fit into the global order. But in the financial services sector, however, they started copying everybody else. You know, it's essentially, if I can just spend a couple minutes, you know, the global market is a pyramid. The exchange at the top, 
the broker dealer are the members, and the customers and the buy side are behind the, the broker dealers. It's a pyramid. It's a net settlement. It's a net risk management. It's a margin. So everything is very efficient. But at the same time, it's a layered market. China started that way 20 years ago as well. But what happened is, what we have here in the global market, MF Global in 2008, took customer money, started to do something bad about it. It occasionally happens, we deal with it. In China 15 years ago, the entire broker-dealer community almost become corrupt, and they all started to take customer money out. As a result, the government ended with a big bag of laws that it has to deal with. So China then decided to completely restructure the market. So China now, the broker-dealers are completely out of the market. Every investor, 130 million investors, every one of them opened directly account with the clearinghouse, with the exchange, with the custody bank. So China is now becoming the only market that is flat, that is completely transparent. If you think we're struggling with MIFID 2, they're MIFID 10. And every single, if the stock goes up 30%, they are instantaneously able to tell who is trading. And they can freeze the account instantaneously and deal with it. So with that kind of market, they are very proud to think it is the most efficient, regulatorily efficient market. But the reality is also that market has, life has been sucked out of it because institutionalization is not happening. No real invest, institutional investors are able to help. The middle layer is completely gone. So you basically have 100 million retail investors whose money is sitting in the banking system. The banks are the ones who are taking care of that. Other than that, they are on their own. All the state is absolutely controlling you know, every, you know, every single account. So that, if we wanted to connect with them, they are already saying that your system is no longer really that great. It's almost like a muddy water. You have too many catfish down there we couldn't see. Because in our situation in New York, London, and Hong Kong, if a stock goes up 30%, I only know Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and Merrill Lynch are trading. I have to make a whole bunch of calls to figure out who is trading. Obviously, MIFID II and everything else now give us greater information and data. But by and large, the Chinese are saying, yeah, we love to do business with you. We would love to come out. We'd love you to come in, but do it our rules. But we can't, right? The whole international market, you know, yes, from a regulatory perspective, you know, we, it's not, we, had, we don't have a see-through system. It's not as easy for us to catch thieves and bad guys. But on the other hand, our market is completely vibrant with so many layers of risk management, so much money that is going into yep. creativity. So the point I'm trying to make is that the Chinese market is almost like a round pipe, and ours is a square pipe. It doesn't fit. We are 110 voltage. They are 220 voltage. It doesn't fit. Somebody need to find a way to translate it. Somebody need to find a way to connect them. Somebody need to f make it feel. So our mission. Our idea is not about we have a better relationship with them, we have a better idea. It's about creating a destination market in the Asian time zone that are in sync with them, but structurally connected. That's the stock connect. That's the bond connect. I, I want you to ask questions because I don't want to be talking no, in sure. a monologue. Um, I, will, I, will, I will interrupt then. <laughs> um, you heard David Schwimmer talking about Shanghai Connect. Um, he seems to be very happy with that relationship, although uh, he said that they've had one since June, which doesn't seem like a huge number. What's, what's the benefit of the Hong Kong Connect versus the Shanghai Connect? Well, I wish we patented the word connect when we did it, because it's, it's a very different concept, right? You know, I think uh, today, um, you know, the, the listing of GDR is really a cross listing in many ways. Right. But we did that 20 years, 25 years ago. So today we have maybe 500 massive, you know, uh, Chinese companies listed. 60% of our market cap are Chinese companies. 70% of the daily trading uh, companies that have some sort of a China origin. So all this cross listing we did in 20 years ago, and it's massively, you know, successful. You know, with both listed in Hong Kong and uh, in China. But the Connect program going back to the differences between these two markets. International market participants don't want to go there because there you have to pre-fund your account. If you don't have money, you cannot buy. If you don't have securities, you cannot sell. 
Ours is T plus two. So people make market decisions, and then the back office figure out how to settle and clear them. The Chinese require everything to be pre-funded. So how do we find a way to make everybody still trade? So Connect works this way. People here are internationally, but now today thousands of thousands, of tens of thousands of Chinese and international investors are putting order into Hong Kong exchange. We order pipe that to Shanghai, matching it in Shanghai. So Mr. Smith in Dutch, in, in Netherlands, and Mr. Swan in Shanghai are matched. But all the international investors settle and clear with Hong Kong clear. Money doesn't go into China. Right. Conversely, Mrs. Wang and millions of Mrs. Wang and Mr. Li are trading Hong Kong stocks now in China by calling their local brokers, going through Shanghai and Shenzhen Exchange, order routed into Hong Kong matching. Yep. But then they settle and clear with China clear. So every day at 8 o'clock, there are only two parties that exchanging money or securities. If as a market we bought more, I own them shares and uh, money. If we sold more, we own them shares. So eight o'clock at Shenzhen Bridge, so to speak, I'm carrying right. a bag of securities or cash, the other guy carry a bag, and then we exchange. As a result, the whole idea is that everybody is trading 80% of Chinese market cap is now being treated under Connect. 80% yes. of a Hong Kong market cap. 40 trillion of Hong Kong dollar worth is being traded by the Chinese millions, millions of times a day. Mm -hmm. So the result of that is that um, everybody is trading on home roof, but as everybody is going there. Why the Chinese like that? Because China is really afraid of uncontrolled, unsafe, massive migrations of funding back and forth. Yeah. So as it is this way, Mrs. Wang bought HSBC shares but if he, she sells that shares, the money goes back to China, a clear account under Mrs. Wang, so he, yeah. she can only take money out of China. So not the capital flight vehicle. So today, if you look at the shareholder register of all Chinese companies, Hong Kong Clear is increasingly becoming the biggest shareholder of every company. Okay. Not because we bought it, it's because investors bought it. We are the nominee. Okay. Um, so thinking about your transaction with the Lion Stock Exchange, just this, the, the, big, big, the big picture here, it says in your offer document, in your note to, to investors, your presentation, connecting the established financial markets in the West and the emerging financial markets in the East, i.e. China. How exactly are you going to connect? You talk about Mrs. Wong and Mr. Li. We have billions of dollars of savings in China when capital controls are, are, are relaxed. Is the idea that there is a wall of savings that comes to London? I mean, how does it actually work? The idea that China will actually one day relax its capital control, we've been talking about it for 20 years. We're going to continue to talk about it for 20 more years. Because China, today, they are great planning. They're great planners of their domestic economy and financial affairs. But they fundamentally is having a big challenge in dealing with the outside, simply because they don't want to give up their standards. They want everybody else to come in. QFI, for example. QFI now, they have eliminated all quotas now. But QFI requires you to come into China to eat Chinese food, and eat Chinese food only. And yeah, there will be a bunch of people who will come. But in the end, larger number of customers, investors, who are really interested in China, but who are not willing to go that extra mile. So capital control will continue to be with us in our generation. Does that mean that we will just simply accept the fate that connectivity cannot happen? No, we don't. Today, Stock Connect, Bond Connect has no quota. Why? It's simply because everybody realized that this is not a massive movement of fund. Over the last five years of Connect, there's only 150 billion renminbi that managed to cross northbound into China. In that process, about 10 trillion renminbi worth market cap were created on each side, open positions, basically. International people holding about 10 trillion Chinese securities now in Hong Kong, under Hong Kong Clear. China Clear holds about 10 trillion of Hong Kong stocks there. Overall, 120 trillion in trading volume. So essentially, we're talking about for every $100 trading, $10 market cap get created, $1 money, money actually flow across the border. That is just wonderful news for China. Mm -hmm. 
because they allow their investors to be able to deploy their national wealth on the global scale if Hong Kong is able to have a lot of international goods. If we can partner with London, all the London product can be in that mall in Hong Kong so that the Chinese investors during Asian time zone, in their day, they can look at the mall. The mall have Ch Chinese stocks, Hong Kong stocks, Asian stocks, London stocks, European stocks. Over time, we build a lot of product for that deployment in the Asian time zone. So and that's it, is to yeah. be able to offer that kind of supermarket uh, effect. Yeah. Yeah. Then later on, when we have that sort of open position, particularly on derivatives, then you will very quickly realize that when the sun sets in the east, when the Chinese and Hong Kong people go to sleep, if we are together with LSE, then we can figure out a way to get that trillions of dollars open position somehow structurally and safely migrated into the European time zone. That's, that's of course, the big, been the big dream of exchanges for the longest time, which is to capture the network effect yes. of the sun rising in the east and the open positions on all the risk management all the way through. The bit, the bit that's missing from this is the US. What would be the, what would, what, how would you get the US time zone? Well, the US have... By the New York Stock Exchange as well? Well, the US Vermont. have overlapping trading hours with London. Yeah. The US, on the other end of the sun, have a little bit of a trading hour overlap with us on our late night, uh, on our night trading hours. So we will be able to get a very solid 18 hours trading and essentially covering everything. Yeah. So this combined group, what is, if the Chinese don't want to talk to the Americans, if the Chinese are not allowed to really make a significant investment into the US or vice versa, this group in 10 years time, obviously this is a big dream, it's a big vision. It's gonna take yeah. a lot of work to get it done. Yeah. You know, we have to work with the Bank of England, with the FCA, because we have to make sure that this market ultimately are able to benefit from that tidal wave of opportunities, but without undue risks being concentrated I mean, in that. This, this, kind of, this kind of idea where you put two exchanges together with the idea of creating seamless flows is obviously not a new one. We saw it with New York Stock Exchange, Euronext. That didn't work. Deutsche Börse, NYSE, New York Stock Exchange. The, 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 the London Stock Exchange's previous attempt to deal with the TMX in Canada, the, again, it was all about network effects and connectivity. Correct me if I'm wrong, but none of that really ever worked. It all looked very good in investor presentations, but it actually, for regulatory reasons, cross-border, other cross-border obstacles, um, all sorts of reasons didn't work. Why will it work this time, do you think? The key difference, the key difference is that all the others, essentially, the opportunity is not incrementally increasing. The opportunity is pretty much the ceiling. It's just the people trying to see if together we can cut a lot of people out, we can fire a lot of uh, other people, we can restructure, we can do all the cost synergies. All this m and are driven by largely cost synergies, which is really firing people. And uh, obviously when you fire all the people, particularly if the people actually are, you know, when you were doing synergy discussions, it's very easy to say, let's get rid of the people. But it's very hard to say when you get rid of the people, whether the opportunity that they were working on is gonna get lost as well. So I think uh, it's not really working there because the synergy can only go so far. Yeah. But we are talking about here, together we are unlocking a uh, last frontier. It is interesting that in your, uh, in your presentation, the word the synergies is not mentioned once, well, which, we, is, uh, which is quite unusual for these things. So to, to reinforce your point, well, yeah. We are still working on our synergy numbers yeah. because most of the transactions, you have the management working with you yeah. and then it's a friendly you know, conversation, very quiet, then come up with a supported transaction. You know, we, I regret to say that we were a little bit late. You know, we had wanted to do this for quite a while. The strategic rationale came to us in great conviction for a while, but we thought we could wait a little bit more. We thought Brexit is going to create all these uncertainties that we probably can live without. We could potential, we're waiting for March 31st, and then we want to do something, and then it came and gone. And then October 31st is the one we're waiting for, and then event overtook itself, 
Now, our tough decision is now or never. Do we, we know the odds is low. We know the other side is already engaged. Not exactly the best time to make a proposal. But our conviction in this is so deep, it's so profound, that if we have to take some risk, we have to take some loss of face because the other side will reject us. If I were sitting in David's shoe, I will reject Charles Lee. That's just the nature of things. We accept that. And we have to have a few tough words. That's just life. But we think the opportunity is such that we, I think this market, UK market, deserves a look at it. A London shareholder deserves a look at it. Our investor absolutely deserve a look at it. Therefore, we presented ourselves knowing that this is unusual, this is disruptive, but it is something that we really think the UK market, because this great city become a global financial center 30, 40 years ago because you took the dollar and you become the dollar center outside the United States. In 20 years, together, this place, this city is going to be the RMB center. It's going to be the euro center. It's going to be the dollar center. It's going to be the center of everything together. Then we will be working in the same time zone. Not that the, they cannot do it direct transactions with Shanghai. They can. But we will be doing in the same time zone. We're going to figure out how, when Chinese and Asians are asleep, how do we make sure that across the time zone, we can make it work. So the whole idea here is to find a way to structure this massive migration in a safe manner for both the UK market and the Chinese market, and for convenience of both investors here and issuers here, and issuers and investors in Asia. And, and, in a pro, and a, you articulate that very well. And in a post-Brexit world, you could make the case that actually as the UK is searching for a new identity in some way, whether you support Brexit or not, that's a separate question. The UK is searching for identity. London as a financial center is recalibrating itself. Why not actually look to the fastest growing region of the world and think like that? C correct. correct. And the value proposition that UK present to America is going to be so much more than UK and America are already so connected. But being able to connect it with Asia in such a manner, just imagine UK's bargaining power in that entire global scale and the ability to find a way to connect with America. America may have a difficult time directly dealing or connecting with China, but together, we, Hong Kong, UK, English common law, common heritage, and English in America, common heritage, English common law, maybe we will be able to get this polarized world finally somehow structured so together. It's, it's almost, in a way, as to pick up on your very first remark about how everybody's protectionist pulling in, this is almost like a, a globalization comeback. We, we can right. actually do yes. this. Yeah. But we do it in market structures. Yeah. We don't do it, we don't force people yeah. to. We actually respect different sovereignties, different market operators, they wanted to do things differently. Mm. But we get the round pipes and square pipes connected, we get the language translated, we get the clearing houses to play that role so everybody can stay home, play your own market rules, but you're actually investing into the other market. We have one minute left. I need to ask you just about governance, about Hong Kong, what's going on with Hong Kong at the moment in terms of the, you know, let's face it, the, the political situation, the unrest, and the attitude of Beijing to all of this. You mentioned that you know, the timing was not great. Nobody can choose their timing, of course. But what can you say about governance um, for those who might be concerned about the governance of HKEX? A lot of the board members are appointed by the Hong Kong government. You know, you, we, just, we know this, it's in the public domain. I'm not uh, uh, saying anything that's not widely known. What can you say to people who might be concerned about the whole um, governance aspect and particularly the sort of potential for political influence and control from Beijing? Yeah, I mean, we do have a slightly unusual governance structure that has a great reason why it was that way. We don't need to go there. Today, 
if this transaction is allowed to proceed, we will have created a completely different global company. And that governance structure may not necessarily be appropriate for that anymore. So we are completely open to have a good discussion. But today, we don't know with whom we should have that discussion. I can discuss with the air. But at the end of the day, if there is a counterparty who will say, if you do that, we will do this. If you do that, we do that. Everything is open for a conversation. OK. Finally, because I also asked David this question of, of the purpose of an exchange in today's world, how do you think an exchange should articulate its purpose uh, in society generally? Yes. Um, as a market operator, the first and foremost, inside the market, you are the one who are really there to provide an orderly market. You know, disclosure, informed investment decisions, and orderly trading. So that's the given. On the next level, really, you know, we're talking about in this post, you know, financial crisis universe with this polarization, with everybody obsessed about their own domestic market risk management, allowing the market to overall trade in a stable and, you know, safe manner is the utter most important responsibility of the exchange and the market infrastructures. But at the highest level on a global scale, is really we need to lead the, lead the market to do two things. To essentially, well, to, to basically do, to do what we're doing in Stock Connect. Break barriers, but respond, uh, respect sovereignty. Whether the sovereignty in China, sovereignty in Asia, or sovereignty in the United Kingdom. Okay. But we do need to break the barrier, but we need to do it in a way that sovereignty fail, feels that we are bringing everybody together and we are not concentrating the risk together and we're finding ways for us to come together this, in this increasingly polarized world. Great. Charles Lee, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice to see you.